All right. So yeah, so no meeting on Monday. We're just meeting on Wednesday at noon. Remember, it's offset by one hour from normal. So next Wednesday, noon to two, that's our final exam. All right, and if you do the practice test and you can and pay attention to the time it takes you when you're when you're working on practice problems because I'm not changing the type or the difficulty of the problem significantly, right? So you should feel pretty comfortable getting through the practice test in under two hours, right? So you might feel a little bit of time pressure, that's, that's normal, but at the very least, when you're taking the test, make sure you get at least something on the page for every problem, right? Even if you wanna go back and double check your answers on your nomenclature at the end, Make sure you at least get a first try on everything. Don't get hung up on any one part. So just strictly in terms of, of doing the numbers, you have 120 minutes, right? To do 10 problems, that's 12 minutes per page. If, you have, if you're getting hung up for longer than 12 minutes on any one of those sections, you probably need to work at it more because all of those problems can be solved in significantly less than 12 minutes. Um, students that are, that are, granted this is a skewed sample, but students who are good at taking tests and properly prepare can usually finish and get in the 80s and you can finish the test in half an hour to 45 minutes. Some of you are going to go slower at tests, that's fine. That's why I write it so that it can be done in half an hour to 45 minutes, but you have a two whole hours. Right, to account for the fact some of you are get, you're going to get stressed out, you're going to get hung up in certain places. Practice with the timing, though. Don't just sit down with the practice test, practice the problems without thinking about pace. Okay, you guys know this stuff, you've been working at this stuff for a long time now. Well, 11 weeks, but that's kind of a long time. Um, so remember, the test is your chance to show me what you've learned, even if you can't get the 100% right answer get an answer, or at least the start of an answer on the page so I can give you partial credit, okay? <clears throat> and we'll go over the specific um, practice problem and work through some of those problems after we finish our last topic, which is what's called the ideal gas law. Yeah. So any calculator will work. Um, whatever calculator you've been using, I want you to keep using that. That includes your phone. Everything short of Wolfram Alpha. Um, if you have your phone, I'm just going to have you put it on airplane mode and you know, and turn off the Wi-Fi and just remind you that, yes, I know that during the test, you could easily turn it back on and get back on the Wi-Fi to look stuff up. I'm, I'm aware of that, but it's really, really obvious when I get a Wikipedia definition. Um, uh, for the vocab section that somebody's looked it up and you will get zero points for that problem and probably for the whole test if you do that it's just not worth gambling so with that in mind i have no problem letting you use your cell phones as your calculator whatever you have been using it's got to be able to do square roots and logs and things like that but whatever you've got is fine uh, any other logistical questions all right, does anybody have an issue with the calculator? Or if you have a problem with the calculator, you need to borrow a calculator. We have some extra TI-83s in the lab too. So if you want to borrow one for the test, that's fine. Just make sure you know how to use it. Don't get to the test, sit down with a calculator you don't know how to use and not be able to take a log when you need to. All right. So the ideal guess law is, is really the, the point of all the simple gas laws that we're gonna go through. We're, I'm kind of explaining the logic behind how all these variables are tied together. But the ideal gas law is the one that matters most often. If you have all the variables necessary, the ideal gas law is the one that's most useful. Um, it's not ideal in the sense that it's perfect or it's, you know, it's what you want to use in all, all circumstances. It's ideal in the sense we're assuming it's an ideal gas. 
meaning it's a gas where the gas molecules never go through a phase change and take up no, no space on their own. So it's basically, it's making the, some assumptions is what makes it an ideal gas. It's not that the gas law itself is ideal, if that makes any sense. Um, so we started with Boyle's law, which was pressure versus volume. We said, okay, well, if we make our, if pressure is as a result of, if pressure is equal to force over area and the force is due to the gas molecules bouncing off the side, changing that area, but keeping the force the same is going to change our pressure, right? If we decrease the area, pressure goes up, right? So we would expect pressure to be proportional to be this is called inversely proportional. When one goes up, the other goes down. You double your pressure, your volume got cut in half. You double your volume, your pressure gets cut in half. Right? And so this is, is the root equation where, it, where this comes from, but we usually write it in a different format, what we've seen before. Um, and it comes from this general graph. If you plot volume versus pressure, you get a one over X graph. And if we rearrange that, we can get pressure times volume equals a constant. And this is assuming for all of these that that force is not changing, that the number of molecules isn't changing and that the temperature is not changing. Um, and if we continue to rearrange that, we can say, okay, well, that means that as long as we've got same number of molecules at the same temperature, any combination of pressure times volume is equal to the same constant. So we write it in this form more frequently. And so for any system, at a constant temperature with a constant number of gas molecules, we know that this is true. All right, so this is review at this point. Um, we talked a little bit about pressure units. Um, and basically the, the main thing you need to know out of these is all of these pressure units are all equal to each other. They're all considered the standard atmospheric pressure. So they just basically picked, okay, sea level on this day, we're just going to say this is one atmosphere of pressure. And then they just related all these other units to it and said, here's our definition for all of them. So it's exactly 760 tor. Uh, it's not exactly that many Pascals. That's a measured number. 14.7 is a measured number. It is exactly one atmosphere. Um, and all these numbers, whether they're measured or exact, it's on the equation sheet as well. And so if I go to the practice exam and look at the equation sheet attached to the practice exam, just so we're all looking at the same thing here. This section right here. So one Pascal is defined as being one Newton per square meter. And all of these are all equal to each other. One atmosphere is 101,325 sorry, 1, 101, Pascals and 760 torque and 14.70 pounds per square inch. All of those are equal to each other. So any combination of those can be used as a conversion. So, just for practice, 608 bar is our standard atmospheric pressure at lake level. What is that in pounds per square inch? What's the equality that we would be using? 
We need to cancel out tor and be left in PSI, right? So go to your equation sheet, find the 760 tor, and say, oh, 760 tor is equal to one atmosphere, which is also equal to 14.7 PSI. So 14.7 PSI, it's written more mathematically, but this is PSI pounds per square inch is equal to 764. So once you have it written this way, it's just a regular conversion, right? It doesn't trick you about it now. Cancel out four, we left in PSI. So something right around what 11 11.8 and this is where we can talk a little bit about the fact that we live in altitude means um, if you've ever if you have a car with higher pressure sensors and you fill them up to correct pressure up here and then you drive down to the bay area your tire pressure light goes on because it because it's now underfilled relative to sea level pressure by a couple psi. That's pretty standard. We just have to live with that up here um, because if any time you go change in your atmospheric pressure, your tire pressure is going to be a little bit off too. All right. So. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on pressure units because it's just more units. Once you know what they are and where to find them on your conversion sheet, there's nothing really interesting about them beyond that, right? Um, occasionally, you see things in kilopascals. There's nothing weird about kilopascals. It's just using kilo as a prefix, just like with anything else. A kilopascal is a thousand pascals. So atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals. Um, one place that you might see this show up is if you do, if anybody uh, does any amateur meteorology or looks at like um, weather predicting apps that have barometric pressure, they actually normalize our barometric pressure to, to sea level so that we can compare to pressures for rising pressure and lowering pressure relative to sea level pressures. So you can't actually just look up atmospheric pressure up here on a weather app because they screw with the numbers to make it easier for people who don't know what they're doing, um, which took me a really long time to figure out why none of the numbers I could look up actually worked. That's why we have to have a mercury barometer in the lab um, because we have to look up our pressure ourselves, or we have to measure our pressure ourselves. We can't just look it up for any given day. All right. Now we talked about volume and temperature. We said, okay, well, if we increase the temperature, our volume has to go up. Because if we are doing this, if we have a piston that can change volume, it's changing against the atmospheric pressure, right? It's pushing against the atmospheric pressure. So assuming that the atmospheric pressure isn't changing, we have a constant pressure in this system. So when you, if you have a constant pressure, and remember that pressure is equal to force over area, If we increase the temperature, we increase the force of each of the molecules, right? So then what has to happen to the area for the pressure to stay constant? Area has to go up too by the same amount. If you double the amount of force, you have to double the amount of area to keep the pressure constant. Right, and so that's what leads to these graphs. And again, this only works in Kelvin, um, and it's one of the most important reasons to always write your units. In this case is if you don't write your units, 
you're not going to see when Kelvin and Celsius don't cancel out with each other. If you write your units, when you plug them in, you'll see, oh, I have Celsius and Kelvin both left over and those are supposed to cancel out. I was supposed to put Celsius into Kelvin. It's a reminder to tell you if you forgot to do that step, right? So even, it's going to be a lot of writing for these units here in a minute, but it's worth doing so that you don't do something dumb. Dumb's not a great word for it, but make an easy mistake. Um, leave points on the table by just doing, forgetting something like converting Celsius to Kelvin. Anybody remember what the conversion is, Celsius to Kelvin? It's been a bit. Two seventy three point one five. Also on our conversion sheet here. Temperature in Kelvin is equal to temperature in Celsius plus two seventy three point one five. A reminder: if you ever get a negative number in Kelvin, you screwed up somewhere. Full stop. You can never get a negative number in Kelvin. I guess it's possible that uh, somebody gave you bad numbers and that's why you're getting a negative number in Kelvin, but it's not a real system. There's something wrong with the system if you ever get that. All right, so then rearranging these in a similar way. They told me they were done with the chop saw. Um, well, hopefully that's the last one. If we do this, if we re rearrange it the same way we did pressure and volume to say, okay, any combination of volume and temperature is equal to the same constants, we wind up with a, a law that looks somewhat similar. It's volume one over temperature one equals volume two over temperature two. And this again has some constraints. This is assuming we're not changing the number of gas molecules. And it's assuming we're at that constant pressure, that your pressure is not changing. We have that piston that's freely moving up and down. So there's no change in pressure. There's only change in volume and temperature. So if we have a, a system that looks like this, say, okay, I sealed a one liter bottle or a, a one liter piston at 22 Celsius, and then I heated it up to 51 Celsius. What's the new volume? It's just a matter of plugging, what, plugging in what you have and solving for what you don't. Right, so recognizing units is key here, right? You need to know that liters is a volume unit. You need to know that Celsius is a temperature unit. But once you do, it's just a matter of plugging your numbers. So So temperature one is 22 Celsius, so right around room temperature. But this only works in the absolute temperature unit, so we need it in Kelvin. So luckily that's an easy conversion. We don't even have to multiply, right? Temperature in Kelvin is equal to temperature in Celsius plus 273.15. So 22 plus 273.15 is 295. Temperature two is 51 Celsius. And so 51 Celsius gives us 324. And just a reminder, when writing Kelvin as units, we don't use the degree symbol. I'm not going to mark you wrong, but take off points if you use the degree symbol, but it's typically not done. Remember, degree is when you're marking out a hundred of something in between two endpoints, and that's not how Kelvin is defined. So if we want to solve, if we want B2, we just plug in our numbers, do some algebra. So 1.0 liters over 295. 
equals V2, which is what we're solving for over 324. So solve for V2, multiply both sides by 324. And what do we get? Something like 1.2. If you just plugged in Celsius, you would get that the volume doubled, which is not accurate because remember, we need it to be that this graph where it goes through the origin. If it doesn't, the line doesn't go through the origin, then that equation doesn't work. That gas law doesn't work. They have to be proportional for that to work. So that's why it has to be in Kelvin because otherwise you wind up with a weird intercept when you try to, if, if you had the equation for the line, you could still plug in numbers and get the right answer that way. But you can't just use V1 over T1 if you do that. So just always, especially for gases, but in general, in chemistry and physics, uh, it's never going to give you the wrong answer to put everything in Kelvin. And occasionally it will give you the wrong answer if you don't. So it's just a good habit to be in. Anytime you're gonna do math with the temperature, put it in Kelvin. All right, so questions on these first two. Okay, let's get to the more interesting stuff. <coughs> um, so going back to Euclid, which He's one of the ancient Greeks who came up with some of the first definitions in, in geometry. Um, so what they call classical geometry, some of Euclid's axioms um, are, we can say some things that seem really obvious to us that we've known, been taught since we were in elementary school. And for one, if A equals B and B equals C, we know that A and C have to be equal to each other, right? Easy enough. It's a little bit trickier to wrap your head around, but we can do the same thing for proportionality. If A is proportional to B and B is proportional to C, and remember proportional just means that when you, when you plot it, you get a straight line that goes through the origin. A is also proportional to C. So we actually get the next gas law without actually doing an experiment, just from the first two simple, um, simple gas laws, we can say, okay, well, if volume is proportional to temperature and pressure is proportional to one over temperature, we can get to the same type of equation that we just had for volume. We can say pressure one over temperature one equals pressure two over temperature two. And it's good that we don't do this as an experiment because if you try to keep a constant volume, but increase the temperature of a gas, what happens? It breaks, explodes. Rapid expansion of gases, sometimes accompanied by you know, sharp pieces of metal or glass. So we don't wanna do that. So we just stick with classical geometry for this, for this law, which is called the uh, Gay-Lussac's law. And I don't know anything about either Gay or Lussac. They probably discovered it at roughly the same time after Boyle's law was published and Charles' law was published. Um, then two mathematicians probably seized on this right at the same time. Usually when you see it, an equation where it's this two names in the equation, it doesn't mean they were working together. It means that they discovered it at about the same time and couldn't agree on who, who got to put their name on the equation. So they both did. So, you can see where kind of where we're going with this is gives us one more way we can look at change in a system. If we have a constant volume and we change the temperature, the pressure changes. And this is actually one that we probably have more experience with intuitively in everyday life, right? 
because if you seal a bottle at room temperature and then you leave it in a hot car, when you open it again, gas puffs out, right? You hear that hissing because there was an increased pressure inside the bottle relative to the pressure around. Um, and we can calculate what that pressure is by using this equation. It's not all that, all that interesting for this class. It's helpful in physics. Physics does a lot of stuff with these. Um, if you look at designing internal combustion engines, um, these relationships come back a lot. If you do differential equations with these simple gas laws, you get what's called the Carnot cycle or the diesel cycle, depending on what assumptions you make. So basically internal combustion engines are designed based on these simple gas laws, plus some tricky calculus. Not all that helpful here because we're not ready for that yet. Um, so where this really comes together is if we keep moving forward, we can get the combined gas law. If we can do any two of these variables, what, and they're all proportional to each other, what's wrong with having a third variable in there? It's no difference. It still holds that you can say, okay, any combination of pressure, volume, and temperature in this relationship is equal to a constant. As long as we have a constant number of molecules, we're still making that assumption. We're not changing the number of gas molecules. And these start looking like more complicated or more intimidating looking equations. But the nice thing about equations with lots of variables is that means you have to be given lots of information, right? If I give you a ton of information, if I give you a volume before and after, and I give you a pressure before and after, and I give you a temperature before, you just go to your equation street sheet and you look for what equation has all those variables in it. Oh, I've got to be using this one because I've got everything except for T2. Right, so understanding, being able to read the work problem and just look at the units and know what you're looking at is really helpful in this case. And it's just a matter of being able to look at it and say, okay, well, here's my initial pressure. Here's my initial temperature. Here's my initial volume. Boom, that's P1, B1, and T1. I've got to convert the temperature to Kelvin, but then I can plug them in. Then I'm given T2 and V2. What's the new pressure? We're solving for P2. Get everything in the right units, plug it in, solve for what you're missing. It's just algebra at this point. It's what we call a plug and chug problem. Plug everything in, move the variables so you solve what, for what you're missing. So what this one would wind up looking like would be 1.05 ATM times volume is 5.0 liters initially over 298 so, uh, Kelvin. Solving for P2, 34 Celsius. 7307, I think, and 5.1 liters. Yeah, 307. So solve for P2. You can plug in all the numbers first and then do algebra, you can do your algebra and then plug in numbers, doesn't really matter as long as you do the right steps, whatever makes the most sense for you. We'll get something pretty close to 1.05 atmospheres when we solve this, if I'm remembering correctly, maybe a little bit under maybe 1.04 or something like that. Anybody have a number? Oh, okay. So I must have I must have fixed this problem. So P two 
1.06 or 07. Either way, it's within sig figs because we only get to keep two sig figs anyway, based on the volumes. So P2 is just 1.1 atmospheres. So this is all interesting math, I guess, if you're into algebra. Um, we have some new units we can look at. We can have some new things we can calculate. We are going to next thing we're going to do is talk about this assumption. Constant number of molecules. What should happen to pressure if you change the number of gas molecules? If you double the number of gas molecules, what should happen to pressure? Should go up. You have twice as many gas molecules, you have twice as many collisions with the sidewalls, right? You have twice as many collisions and each collision individually is the same force. You have twice as much total force, right? So we should see this relationship too. Number of moles of gas is proportional to volume. And so that this gives us the what's called Avogadro's law. It's the same Avogadro who came up with Avogadro's number. Avogadro is not that common of a name, right? So we would expect it to be the same guy. Um, I guess I don't know about Renaissance Italy, how common Avogadro was as a name, but I don't think it was that common of a name. Um, this gives us one equation that has all of our variables in it. These are all the variables that go into describing a gas. And we can say that as long as any one variable is held constant, what happens if we hold a variable constant? Let's say it's this constant pressure. What happens to P if we have constant pressure? P1 and P2 are the same number. What happens to the equation? There's no change, which means you have the same number multiplied on both sides, right? You can divide both sides by that number without changing the equation, right? And it would just disappear. Any variable that's held constant just gets dropped from this equation. This equation is all of the simple gas laws that we just talked about, all in one combined form. Whatever is constant just gets left off. Right? So if you have a constant number of gas molecules, n is the same number. So you just get rid of it because it's not changing. If temperature is the same, you leave off temperature too. And then you just get P1V1, P1, V1 equals P2V2, which is what we started with. Right, so this has all of the gas laws in it at once. Which is why on the equation sheet, it's all written as one equation. P1, V1 over N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. Don't need to waste time having all of those other equations in there. Whatever's constant, you just leave off. And really, that is probably the most interesting thing about this. We got to all these other all these other gas laws by rearranging them so that they were equal to a constant, right? And then we said, okay, well, if they're all equal to the same constant, we can set before and after equal to each other. Well, if every combination of a gas has the same variables equal to the same constant, that means we don't necessarily need a before and after. If every single variable is equal to the same constant, let's just call that constant R, is the number that, or the letter that was chosen. You can just say, okay, well, PV over NT equals R for any gas. Now it doesn't matter if anything's being held constant or if anything's even changing. 
that's and the reason that that's helpful is that r is a constant no matter what it doesn't matter what gas it is it doesn't matter what system you're talking about these four variables in this relationship always equal the same constant which is weird but also really really powerful turns out that r is actually a result of the way statistics the statistics of random chance at the molecular level happens. Um, you get what's called, it's not a true Gaussian distribution, it's not a bell curve, it's what's called a Boltzmann distribution. Um, but effectively, you can say that every time you have independently moving molecules based on temperature, they're gonna behave the same way. And that's gonna give you a certain value for R. R is one of those fundamental constants of the universe that, People like Einstein and Stephen Hawking are trying to, you know, trying to bring in and fuse into one quote unquote theory of everything. R shows up a lot in that, along with speed of light and the gravitational constant, which is one of those fundamental characteristics of the universe. And this is the form that we're going to use gas laws in most for this class. Because this means if you have a pressure of all human and temperature, you can calculate moles. So this is really just one more way we can do stoichiometry. Because I can give you a volume of a gas at a certain pressure and temperature, and you can figure out how many moles you have, which means you can do stoichiometry with it. Or we can predict how many liters of CO2 are going to be produced when you mix baking soda and vinegar. It's just one more way to do theoretical yield or limiting reactants. <clears throat> All right, so for this class, we're basically only going to use one value for R. Turns out, like I said, R shows up in a lot of different equations because it has to do with the way statistics works. Um, but in this class, we're basically going to always use the same version of R. So you're pretty much always just going to turn around and take any pressure, put it into atmospheres. And you're going to take every volume and put it in liters. And you're going to take every temperature and you're going to put it in Kelvin. And N is always going to be moles. If you know what those units are, if you plug them in, they always are is always the same value. If you have different units, R still exists. It's just a different number. It's like the speed of light is the same, whether you're in meters per second or miles per hour, the number is just different, right? So just to eliminate confusion, we're just only gonna use R in these units, which are liters times atmospheres per mole Kelvin, which is not a unit that makes any sense really, right? That's how do you have a volume times a pressure per mole per Kelvin? That's not a unit, it's not like density where you say, oh, I understand what a gram per cubic centimeter is. There's no real understanding of this unit, that's fine. At this level, that unit is there just to make the, the units work out for the rest of the equation. Everything cancels out. Um, it turns out if you, if you get into thermostatistical thermodynamics um, and liters times atmospheres is actually a energy unit and energy per mole per temperature is an entropy unit, which is a unit of disorder, which is weird, but it has to do with probability and the number of combinations that you can make of something. Um, so it does have some significance, but not anything we're gonna do with, do any math with really. So if we were wanting to do an example here, Let's say we wanted to figure out how many moles of gas were in a scuba tank. You just need to be given three out of the four variables. And then you solve for the fourth. R is always the same. In this case, we're given some information. We're given a volume and a pressure and a temperature. We're solving for N. 
And again, you can do the algebra before you plug in the numbers. If you want to solve for n when everything is still just a variable, that's fine too. So if we multiply both sides by n, divide both sides by r, we get PV over TR equals moles. And then you can plug in your pressure and your volume and your temperature in Kelvin. And then we get a number for N, which should be a fairly big number. Let's see. Something close to 100 moles. Um, what was the temperature? 22, so 298 Kelvin, right? And 0 0.08206 liters, atmospheres per mole Kelvin. If we track our units, we've got atmospheres on top, atmospheres on bottom, liters on top, liters on bottom. Everything cancels out except for moles. So what do we get for N for a number? Does it matter what the gas is? Moles of what? Not for this problem. So what that comes down to is we're making an assumption that the gas molecules don't interact with each other in order to do this. And that's why it doesn't matter what the gas molecules are, just how many of them you have. If you're trying to calculate the total amount of force hitting the walls of this chamber, it just matters how much energy each particle has and how, much, how many particles you have. And since temperature, determines how much energy the particles have. It doesn't matter what their molecular weight is or anything like that. All gas molecules will act the same within sig figs. There's a much more complicated version of the ideal gas law called Van der Waals gas law um, that basically makes some corrections, but it's really, really tricky to use. And it's tiny variations off of the gas law. For the most part, under most circumstances, we can just use this, or as it's more commonly written, PV equals NRT, because nobody likes fractions. Probably more like, because that's easier to write in a textbook and it's all in the same line rather than having to put it in as a fraction. And that's our last new topic. So just in time to be done for a break. Um, I guess the, the one other thing I will define that nah, it's not going to show up really. There is a standard temperature and pressure that saves you some writing sometimes because you can say at STP instead of at zero Celsius in one atmosphere, but it doesn't save you that much writing. And I'm going to explicitly define it anyway. And I think it's actually on your equation sheet for that matter. Oh, well, maybe not. Not for this class. Gen Chem will spend more time with using standard temperature and pressure.
So we'll take our break here. And then when we come back, we'll do a practice psychometry problem. And then we'll just I'll answer, open it up to answering any questions about the practice test. So let's come back at two. Um, what time is the exam at? Noon. 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 Noon on Wednesday. Yeah. So for this number eight, we do just exactly what we did here, just solving for the one that we were looking for, right? Yes, exactly. So if you know how many moles you make, mm -hmm. then I knew it was in here somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, you know moles of hydrogen gas, and you know a volume, so, and you know a temperature. Mm -hmm. So you're just solving for P. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not really sure if I did this one. Right. Let's see. So, so that gets you to assuming you did your your molecular weights right. Uh, I think they're doing a I mean, they're these seem reasonable because and it is a two to one ratio. So so four point four or point zero four four used, and you had more than that. So yeah, then you do the subtraction, uh -huh. good. Divide to get molarity, mm -hmm. take the negative log of it. That all looks right to me. Yeah. 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 Good job. Yeah. If, if there are any mistakes, it's not in the logic, it's just in the algebra. Okay, so but, uh, what, the, what I was not sure about is mm. that if you use the x expression. Yes. But I still did the same thing we did last class, mm -hmm. and we used the expression. So we, it's exactly. Because this number is the same as your concentration in H3O plus because it's an, a strong acid. Mm -hmm. So whatever is left over of this mm -hmm. is your hydronium concentration. Oh, okay. So if and if you ran out of this and you had left over here, then it's a little different. Okay. But in this case, you did it all good. You're good. Thank you. No problem. It is a quick lab, actually. Ten, 10 minute intro and then take three trials of data, but each trial only takes you about 10 minutes. EV. <laughs> Do we tell you which lab you want to draw? It, just, it takes the lowest grade. So if, if you got a zero in somewhere, then you drop a zero. It, it's already taken into account in your grade. It's already dropping the lowest grade. So it's not gonna, you're not gonna get another bump. It's already in there. Okay. So you good then? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. 
The first thing you've done is you should be Yeah. So that's whether there's whether <coughs> if you have a pull on the electrons more to one side than the other side of the molecule. Mm -hmm. We talked about it kind of briefly. Remember, it had to do with the electronegativity. Mm -hmm. If you have a difference in electronegativity, everybody's probably going to have that same that same question. So hold that thought, and we'll go through the criteria and how to. Does this look it. good, though? Yeah. Okay. And I'm being nitpicky, but. The uh, wedged one and the dotted one mm -hmm. should be pointing in the same direction, more or less. Okay. So if this you, one would just sit it on that way or that one. Right. Okay. So, and you want to, we're going to try to make the ones that are flat be uh, roughly drum like they're 120 degrees from each other. So, I'm going to go way around. And then these ones are going to go in the same direction. So, okay. think of it as you've broken up into thirds, but then one of the thirds has two things, one up and, and one down. Like Exactly. Okay, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. Yes. Are they? O would be more electronegative. So sulfur goes in the middle. And if you're if you have questions about the electronegativity, the equation, I think the equation she has does it have electronegativity on there or not? I'll look on the periodic table. Oh yeah. Is it 
All right, so we're back from break. So go ahead and give this, give this a try. Don't have to calculate limiting reactant at least. This is your classic baking soda and vinegar reaction. You dump 10 grams of sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda, into excess vinegar, it makes CO2. How many liters of gas can you make at 1.00 atmospheres and 273 Celsius or So it's a stoichiometry problem. Start by turning grams into moles. Figure out how, make sure it's balanced. Figure out how many moles of product you can make. And then from there, you're solving for volume.
83 point something. What do we get for the molecular weight? Let's see. So it might be hard to tell, but this is actually an acid base reaction. So, and like I've mentioned before, most of those wind up being one to one. Um, so I think this should already be balanced. So if we can make one point point one one nine moles of sodium hydrogen carbonate and every one mole of NaHCO3, one mole of CO2 made. So now we've got three out of the four components of the ideal gas law, right? We have pressure, we have moles, we have temperature, and R is always the same number. So we always have R. That's enough to solve for volume. And if we're tracking our units, everything except for liters cancels out. All right, we've got Kelvin. Kelvin on top, Kelvin on bottom. Moles on top, moles on bottom. Atmospheres on top on one side of the equal sign. So when you divide both sides by that, you'll get atmospheres on the bottom, which cancels out atmospheres on top. So we're just left in liters. What do we get for volume? Looking at the numbers, that seems reasonable. Seems a little bit high when you think about what two liters looks like and what 10 grams of sodium bicarbonate looks like. 10 grams of sodium bicarbonate is like, I don't know, two tablespoons maybe, probably a little bit less. But if anybody who's ever had a kid or a relative do this or done this themselves, you always make more gas when you dump baking soda and vinegar than you think you are which is why it makes such a good volcano, right? For your middle school science project. It gets everywhere because you make a whole lot of gas for a pretty small number of moles. At standard temperature and pressure, one mole of gas is about 22 liters of volume. So gas is a really, really, the opposite of dense, non-dense. Um, and remember how I said that we're making the assumption that these gas molecules don't interact with each other. And that's what allows us to treat all gas molecules the same. Um, the, just to put into perspective how few gas molecules there are, 
in an empty space at sea level gas molecules will it would be the equivalent of traveling from here to jupiter before seeing another person that's about the same distance that a gas molecule travels relative to its size before it bumps into another gas molecule so if you can picture all of these gas molecules spread out so that on average you're that far away from each other like planets in a solar system it's a pretty good assumption that they don't actually interact because they just don't see each other they never get that close to each other or within sig figs all right so all things considered pv equals nrt we can't do it just as a straight up conversion but at the same time, it's really just more stoichiometry at this point. It's just a way for us to either take moles and turn it into something we can measure or take something we can measure as a gas and turn it into moles, right? So that's the way to approach these. And, the, and again, the only place that it will show up, except potentially as occasionally I'll throw an extra credit problem in here somewhere. Um, but the one place that you can be sure it will show up is in, Number eight, one side or the other of a stoichiometry problem will be a gas, a gas. And I'm gonna give you everything you need to either calculate the pressure of the product or start from a pressure and calculate moles or something along those lines, right? So you're just going to have to use, PV equals NRT is going to show up in problem eight in one of the stoichiometry problems. Occasionally I mix up the order but don't be stunned when it happens. It's all it is. It's just one more way we can get to moles or from moles to something else, okay? All right. That being said, uh, does anybody have any requests for problems from the practice test to go over? I already had, I guess I already had one request for polarity. Can you go? Um, just like color, like, okay. Yes, we can. Let's talk about the, um, the Vesper one first, because I did get that one first. I, and then we'll, um, and then we'll talk about reaction types. All right. So we did talk about polar molecules, right? I didn't totally skip over that section. I don't usually just jump a whole topic, but you know, weirder things have happened. Um, so a polar molecule is anytime you've got a difference in electronegativity from one side of the molecule to the other. Basically, it means that the molecules aren't sharing the electrons evenly from one side to the other. All right. So Lewis thought structure, we spent some time on that. You guys did a lot of practice with the Vesper. Um, lab on Lewis dot structures and molecular geometries. Uh, but just in general, our procedure for Lewis dot structures was count valence electrons, put the least electronegative element goes in the middle. You put everything else around it and then you just start divvying up electrons until everything has a full valence and you use the right number of electrons right so our criteria to know if you did it right was number one you've got to use the right number of electrons we can't make electrons out of nothing so and two full valences. If you can say yes to both of those things, then you did you drew a valid Lewis dot structure. Like I said before, ten, sometimes there's more than one valid Lewis dot structure and knowing which one is the best Lewis dot structure is something we talk about in Gen Chem, but for now, this is good. And then from there, we could get to the molecular geometry, right? All we had to do is figure out how many electron groups we had. 
how many things taking up space around that center atom. And then that gives you your overall shape. And then if you have the names memorized, that's the best way to answer this, but you can also just draw it. So if you wind up drawing, drawing them out, make sure you're using the right conventions where you use the wedges to indicate something coming out towards you. The dashed line is going into the board away from you. And you, if you're drawing it, I want to see at least close to the right angles. I don't want you to draw this just with everything at 90 degrees from each other because it's a three-dimensional molecule. And if you're going to not memorize the names of these geometries, you need to at least be able to draw them correctly. So then polarity is anytime you've got a molecule where you've got a pull on electrons more to one side of the molecule than the other. Because even if everything has a full valence and you use the right number of electrons, if one side of the molecule is a bigger bully when it comes to sharing electrons, it's pulling more of the electrons towards itself. Which means you've got extra electrons on one side and too few electrons on the other side. I, one analogy that I, that I use here is it's like sharing a bed with a blanket hog. Somebody who rolls around in the middle of the night and pulls the blankets all towards themselves, that's a more electronegative element. And there's only so much blanket to go around, right? So if they're stealing more blanket, somebody else is being left with less blanket. And so that means you wind up with partial charges on one side of the molecule versus the other. Right, so if you have a case where the electrons are not being shared evenly, that's what makes it a polar molecule. So the way to answer this question is basically, just like with the Lewis dot structures, there's two criteria for it to be a polar molecule. It has to have a difference in electronegativity or what we call a polar bond. And it also has to have asymmetry. Because even if somebody is a notorious blanket hog and they're, they roll around, they pull the blanket. If you, put, if you put two people that roll around and steal blankets in the same bed, then they're constantly pulling blanket back and forth, right? There's no net movement of the blanket one side or the other. So two really strong electronegative elements are not necessarily going to be polar because they're fighting with each other. Tug of war is another good analogy. If you have two NFL teams playing tug of war, then there's not going to be very much net movement. But if you put one NFL team on one side and you put a peewee football team on the other side, the NFL team pulls all the electrons towards themselves. All right, so that's where the asymmetry comes in. It can't just be equally balanced out. You have to have something that's not the same in all directions. All right, so for this example here, if we want to determine if we have polar bonds, we just need to look and say, okay, well, do I have a difference in electronegativity between carbon and chlorine? And all of our electronegativity values are on the equation sheet. On the periodic table, there's an extra, let me see if I can spin this. If we look at electronegativity values for carbon versus chlorine, chlorine is more electronegative than carbon. We did talk about this. I said we use carbon and hydrogen as our cutoff, right? Anything that's a bigger difference in electronegativity than carbon and hydrogen is polar. Anything with a smaller difference than carbon and hydrogen is a nonpolar bond. All right, so going back to our structure here, carbon to chlorine. 
Is that a polar bond? See, about a 0.5 difference, right? 0.6 difference, which is bigger than the difference between carbon and hydrogen. So polar bonds. Yes. So we have polar bonds, meaning we have a bully and we have a bleed. We have carbon is the one that's getting its extra electrons taken from it by the chlorine because chlorine is more electronegative. But do we have any asymmetry? No, we have four NFL teams playing tug of war, tug of war in three dimensions, which now that I say that out loud, I kind of want to see that. Um, I'm not sure how we would set that up, but all of these are exactly the same strength. They're all pulling carbons, electrons, but they're all pulling exactly opposite of each other. So with that in mind, we don't have asymmetry so we'd say this is a nonpolar molecule, right? So that's your checklist. Does it have polar bonds and does it have asymmetry? You have to, if it's a polar molecule, you have to say yes to both of these. If it has asymmetry, but no polar bonds, it's nonpolar. If it has polar bonds, but no asymmetry, it's nonpolar. Both of these have to be yes for it to be a polar bond or polar molecule. And just for context, the way that I would break, so this is this is a 10, 10 points, right? Every section is 10 points. Um, so five points for the top one, five points for the second one, two points, two point, one point. So if you're okay at molecular geometry and you're good at Lewis stock structures and polarity is seeming really confusing to you, you can still get eight out of 10 just on this page and just making, by just ignoring it. Or you can get even half credit for polarity just for writing down the two criteria in both boxes, even if you don't know how to, write, to answer that. Right? So just because you don't get one piece of one of these problems, don't let it throw you off for the whole page. All right? I've probably said something along these lines before, but. I, as a, when I was a student, I intuitively tried to game the system, get all as many points as I could for as little work. Um, and so that's just something that always came naturally. Like, oh, I'm, I'm gonna just skip this section because that's a lot of work for one point. And I'm gonna spend my time studying these other things that are worth 10 points, like the easy stoichiometry ones. I'm not saying that's a, the best option here, but it's certainly a way to cut your losses if you're running out of time to study, if you put yourself into a corner and you don't have time to get all of these topics. Don't spend an hour of time studying polarity if you still don't understand stoichiometry, right? Prioritize, get those easy points. I probably like doing that just because it always felt like I was getting away with something. I'm not gonna bother with that. Why would I bother learning that? It's also why I didn't really understand orbitals until I got to grad school because I just wrote off that whole section. Now I'm not gonna spend my time doing that. I, I can get my points other places. Again, don't be a student like me. All right. What does our, just for, to recap here, I guess the, the key who's gonna go be available um, that has all these answers. So I'm not going to go through the second one, the SO2 one in front of the whole class, but the key will be available. But it's just the same matter of looking for those criteria and see if it, it matches. When will the key be available? 
Um, I think it's set to be available by midnight tonight, but I can change that during. I just want everybody to at least try these on their own before I give you the key, because oh, you'll get more out of it. I think it's either tonight at midnight or like noon tomorrow or something. Um, and the link is on week 11. This isn't due till next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, not tonight. All right. Uh, and then there was a question about how do we recognize reaction types? Um, the way that I would approach reaction types for this for this test for in, in particular <coughs> is process of elimination. You've only got five choices. So every reaction type problem is a multiple choice problem. You just have to know what the choices are. And then if you can eliminate the ones that are really easy to recognize, then you're, you're improving it down to you know, a 50-50 chance, even if you have no idea, but you can still recognize the easy ones. That gives you a lot of um, options there. Um, so our choices are, let's see, there's precipitation and acid base. <laughs> And there was metal redox. Combustion. And what else today? What was the was it gas evolution or something like that? I really metal redox and combustion are the biggest categories for redox reactions. But really, anything you can recognize the charges changing on the individual atoms, you can just write redox for at least half credit. So that's our broad category. And metal redox or combustion are just subsets of that. So acid base can be kind of tricky to recognize sometimes, but combustion is easy to recognize because it always makes what is your product. CO2 and water, right? So right off the bat, looking at this example, we know it's not combustion. If we look at the charges on the, on the atoms, that's chloride with a negative charge. And we know that because it's in an ionic compound with calcium, it always has a plus two, right? So if chloride is negative one here and it's still negative one here, calcium is plus two, and it's still plus two. We've got nitrate on the left and we still have nitrate on the right. So that didn't change charges. And we've got silver ions on the left and we still have silver ions on the right. So nothing changed oxidation states. So that means we can just cancel off this entire category, which means we're down to it's either precipitation or an acid base. So those can both be a little tricky to recognize, but precipitation is a very specific, is a very specific case where you get two aqueous solutions mixed together and it makes a solid. You're making some combination of ions that no longer dissolves in water. So anytime you can say, okay, well, I've got two ionic compounds on the left. I have two ionic compounds on the right, but now one of them is a solid, boom, precipitation. So that's one of those ones that once you know what to look for, these ones are really obvious too. So combustion and precipitation are the first two I would consider and then cross out when I was, if I was doing these because they're the fastest to recognize. If it's not one of those, it's either acid base or it's some other redox reaction. So you can look at it and say, well, I don't see anything that looks like an acid base reaction. There's no H pluses moving around, right? There's no H pluses period. So I can cancel off, cancel out acid base, right? So that's, that's the way that I would approach this, especially from a test taking perspective is just what can I rule out and what's left? Right. And, and again, those redox ones, it's always going to be, you're always going to be able to see something changing oxidation state. If you can't see something changing oxidation state, a specific atom that goes from a plus two to a minus two, for instance, 
then it's not a redox reaction. And, and again, all of these different categorizations of reactions depends on what class you're in. It depends on what field you're in. Nurses don't think about redox reactions that much. They think a lot about things like competitive inhibition in, um, in enzymes, right? So biochemistry has its whole own classification of reactions as it applies to biochem. That's not something an engineer ever cares about. I guess I shouldn't generalize. Most engineers don't care about biochemistry. So they might care a lot more about redox reactions and corrosion resistance and talk a lot about redox reactions and have specific types of redox reactions that they're looking at. So for this class, we're just doing those four basic types. You've got precipitation and acid base, you've got combustion and you've got other redox reactions. And just treat each of them like it's a multiple choice question. And again, the more time you spend with it, the more the easier it is to recognize them. So what would, broadly speaking, how could we approach this? What can we rule out right away? Precipitation, we don't have two, two different ionic compounds on the left. We are making a solid, but we don't have ionic solutions on the, on the reactant side. So it's not precipitation. It's definitely not combustion. Is it an acid base reaction? No, not really. I mean, there are hydrogens, so we have to consider it. But we've got hydrogens that are going from a plus one charge, plus one oxidation state with the water to being neutral. So they're changing oxidation state, boom, it's a redox reaction. Right, redox, more specific metal, metal redox if you wanted to, because there's a metal that's being oxidized, it's starting as a metal and turning into an ionic compound. So we can just look at this and say, okay, metal redox, we're good, just by going down that list, eliminating things. Does that help? Okay. And I probably will change the order of these stoichiometry ones at least a little bit. Otherwise it's the same, the same reactions types in the same order too, because I'm not gonna ask you about a pH question for something that's not an acid base reaction really. Um, but anytime you've got hydroxides being turned into water, that's because you gave it an extra H plus, right? So a hydroxide turning into water is a really good clue. It's an acid base reaction or an acid that's no longer an acid, an acid that's losing its H plus. That's gonna be an acid base reaction. We just gave an H plus from the hydroiodic acid to the hydroxide to make water. And then the calcium and the iodide are just what are left. Right, so, and if we looked at the oxidation state of everything before and after, oxygen's minus two, and it's still minus two. Iodide is minus one, it's still minus one. Calcium's plus two, it's still plus two. So nothing changed charges, changed oxidation states. So that means it's not redox. And if it's not redox and it's not precipitation, that's space. All right, who else has something they want to go over? A question about what we've been talking about. I got a question for number three. Are we supposed to determine Oh, sorry, again, so this was when this was an open book test. So yes, if I, if I, I will have saw that phrase something like this, but I will include solubility rules. Um, probably just ones that look like the um, Wikipedia ones, not the big chart, just the little list of these things dissolve, these things don't. Um, yeah, so no, you do not need to memorize that. Anything else? What else do you guys want to talk about? What else is still tricky?
or do we want to end 15 minutes early? This is your chance. Yeah, Nigo. So you're going to have like the concerns to the best use uh, Yes, if it's not later to, I think it's tonight is what it's supposed to automatically go live, but I'll probably just turn it live as soon as we get done with lab today. Uh, all right. Then. Yeah. yeah. The electron configurations can you still start at R lines higher than 18. Um, you can. You can still start at argon for the electron configurations if it's more than 18. If it's less than 18, I want you to write them all out. The 1s2, 2s2, etc. Right, but anything past argon. All right. And we'll start. Uh, we'll start lab a few minutes early too. For those of you who have lab today, we'll start 10 minutes early for lab. So take 15 minutes. Thank you. 